Hello, I'm Margaret Hoover, great-granddaughter to Herbert Hoover, the 31st President of the United States of America. I am at the Herbert Hoover National Historic Site and Hoover Presidential Library Museum, located in West Branch, Iowa. Great-grandfather wanted this place to be an inspiration to everyone who comes to visit. Please join me on a journey into the past and enjoy a remarkable story about an orphan from a small town in Iowa who grew up to become President of the United States. Great-grandfather was born in this two-room cottage, which was built by his father, Jesse, in 1871. He lived here with his father, mother, Hulda, brother, Theodore, and sister, Mary. This entire home is about the size of a standard living or family room today. It's hard to believe that the Hoovers all shared one bedroom and that their bathroom is outside with no heat or water. They only had this cook stove for heat, which also served as their stove for food, heating water, cleaning up, and, well, just about everything that required heat. My great-grandfather and his brother and sister had many chores including gardening and gathering wood and, of course, getting the water from the well. My great-great-grandfather, Jesse Hoover, also built a blacksmith shop near the cottage. West Branch had about 500 people then, but there was enough business to keep three such shops busy. A blacksmith did a variety of jobs, including shoeing horses, repairing farm machinery, and making tools. These Hoovers were a very devout Quaker family and they worshiped at this meeting house on Sunday and on Wednesday. The Society of Friends, which they were called, had no paid minister or priest at their meetings. So church members would sit silently, thinking or praying, and any adult who felt moved by the spirit could share his or her feelings with the others. In West Branch, the Quakers contributed to the community's first small school in 1853. Originally, the building was used as a one-room schoolhouse where children of all ages were taught by one teacher. They didn't even have pencils or paper. Students learned the basics of reading, writing, and arithmetic, doing their work on slates. The teacher also was expected to clean the building and to keep the fire stoked in the winter. Jesse Hoover died when my great-grandfather, or Bertie as he was called back then, was only six years old. His mother, Hulda, died only three years later. Family members held a meeting, and Theodore, Bertie, and Mary were sent to live with a relative. Little Bertie lived for a time with his aunt and uncle, Mr. and Mrs. Allen Hoover, on a nearby farm. When great-grandfather was 11, he was sent to Oregon to go live with an aunt and uncle. Of course, there were no airplanes or cars, so he traveled all by himself on an immigrant train. I can only guess, but I bet he was very scared, homesick, and especially missed his brother and sister. You know that the relatives who sent him on this unforgettable journey did not realize that this timid orphan would become a successful mining engineer, organizer of food relief operations, secretary of commerce, and the 31st president of the United States. the word library mean to you? I've always thought it was a place to get books, but presidential libraries are very different than libraries where you get books. A presidential library, like the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library Museum, is a place where the written and video record, as well as the physical history of our presidents, is kept and preserved. This kind of library can take you back on a journey into the life and times in which each president lived and served our nation. So let's begin the Hoover Presidential Library Museum journey into his life and times. Working very hard to earn his keep at his aunt and uncle's place in Oregon, great-grandfather didn't have time to go to school during the day. As a matter of fact, he did not even graduate from high school. However, his parents' upbringing and his Quaker background taught him that education was very important, so he attended night school in Salem after work each day. He convinced his uncle to let him attend a new college called Stanford University. And, as it turned out, he was a member of the first graduating class at Stanford, 
getting a degree in geology. He also met his future wife and my great-grandmother, Lou Henry, while he was there. Anxious to put his knowledge to good use, great-grandfather Hoover became a mining engineer. He traveled all over the world to Australia, China, and Great Britain, turning old mines of gold, silver, lead, and zinc into very profitable money-making businesses. His work as a mining engineer made him a very wealthy man. But when World War I began in 1914, he gave up his business career to help feed the starving people of Belgium. From that moment, he dedicated his career to serving the public, and he refused to take a penny of salary for his efforts. When the United States declared war on Germany in April of 1917, President Woodrow Wilson asked great-grandfather Hoover to manage the food grown in our country. Following his plan, millions of Americans conserved food so that more could be shipped overseas to soldiers and the starving people of those countries. Hoover's programs allowed citizens to make sacrifices for others without being forced to do so by the government. When World War I ended in 1919, great-grandfather Hoover was back in Europe as director of the American Relief Administration which fed 350 million people in 21 countries. Many adults and children sent gifts of thanks. Women decorated sacks that held flour sent from American mills, while school children wrote poems, drew pictures, and marched in parades to repay him for his kindness. In 1921, he became Secretary of Commerce under President Warren G. Harding. During the next seven years, he helped create safer highways and airplanes better health care for children, and rules that allowed American businesses to make better products. He helped make radio a popular pastime, and he appeared on the very first television broadcast from New York City to Washington, D.C. in 1927. When the Mississippi River flooded that year, great-grandfather organized 600 boats and 60 airplanes to rescue 325,000 people who had been forced from their homes by raging waters. He traveled to 91 towns, asking citizens to set up camps in which the victims could eat and sleep. By 1928, Herbert Hoover was one of the most well-known and respected men in the United States. In November of that year, he was elected as our 31st president, and he planned to bring new ideas and programs to the American people. But in October of 1929, only seven months after he and his wife Lou moved into the White House, the New York stock market crashed. Due to the resulting financial panic, many workers lost their jobs, banks and businesses failed, and many people became homeless and hungry. Known as the Great Depression, this period was a difficult one for great-grandfather Hoover, who was unable to solve the problems created by the financial panic. Years earlier, he had warned President Calvin Coolidge that such an event might occur, but his opinion was ignored and people continued to buy and sell stocks in a dangerous way. He always believed the American people could prevail by banding together to help one another in their own communities. He also created new programs to help banks, businesses, and farmers, but these efforts were not enough to end the hard times, made worse by the drought that occurred in 1930. When he ran for re-election in 1932, he was defeated by Franklin Roosevelt, who served as president for the next 12 years. In 1933, great-grandfather moved back to California, where he kept busy reading, writing, and spending time with his family. Well known as an expert fisherman, he also found time for his favorite hobby. After Franklin Roosevelt passed away in 1945, President Harry Truman invited great-grandfather, now in his 70s, back to the White House. When World War II ended later that year, Truman chose him to help the starving people of Europe once again. I have a job for you that nobody else in the country can do, Truman told him. In 1946, great-grandfather traveled to 38 countries in an uncomfortable airplane called the Faithful Cow. After he finished this important job, he worked with Presidents Truman and Eisenhower to improve our country's government. He also continued to serve as chairman of the Boys Clubs of America, helping to open 500 new chapters throughout the United States. Lou, his beloved wife and my great-grandmother, passed away in 1944 at the age of 69. She had been president of the Girl Scouts of America. 
For the rest of his life, my great-grandfather continued to work, writing 14 books and many speeches, appearing on television, and helping to open his own presidential library and museum in 1962. He believed that people could learn about their history, their presidents, and their country by visiting the library and museum, which holds many objects, letters, and documents connected with his life and work. Two years after the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum opened, my great-grandfather died at the age of 90 on October 20, 1964. Five days later, he was laid to rest on this hill near the cottage where he was born. Although some people remember him as the man who was the president during the Great Depression, he had earned the respect of millions by working hard to help people all over the world. I hope you have enjoyed this short introduction into the life and times of Herbert Hoover, our nation's 31st president. I invite you to come for a visit soon to learn more about his presidency, your state, and your country. I'll leave you with great-grandfather's words of wisdom, which I hold dear. No matter how deeply we feel at the present moment, our vision must stretch over the next 100 years, and we must write now into history such acts as will stand credibly in the minds of our grandchildren.